Welcome back to the Health Physics Society's video series, Pursuing the Truth and Promoting Transparency regarding the historical foundations of the current radiation protection philosophy based on a linear no-threshold theory for cancer risk assessment. I'm Dr. John Cartarelli, President of the Health Physics Society. In the sixth episode, we learned about the origins of the LNT single-hit theory and several limitations of the study Muller used to justify it. The seventh episode takes place during the beginnings of the Manhattan Project in the early 1940s when the U.S. government taps new researchers and study designs to gain a deeper understanding of radiation's biological impact. Who's the first to publish these new findings? Let's find out. I found a lot of uh, problems with their study. A, a lot of problems. And I'm only just scratching the surface now. It's me going back and looking after all these years, and I find that Muller and his graduate student never mentioned any of these, or most of them were not mentioned. Did anyone try to replicate that study? That's, yes, it was attempted to be replicated in the Manhattan Project, and I'll move on to that next, actually. But what, what really happened in this case is, is, that, uh, is that this study had a lot of problems with it, and Muller attempted to deflect, camouflage, cover up the problems, uh, not let anybody really see and understand these problems because he, he was really being thoroughly beaten by Statler. And he needed a new direction. And he got this new direction. And the study was, well, the study was flawed in many ways. And in retrospect, if, if I were to, to look at it, it probably wouldn't have even qualified as a, as a doctoral dissertation. It was more uh, hypothesis generating you know, at, at that stage of the game. It had too many flaws, and, and, it, was, uh, and it was unbelievable that Muller would, would in fact cite that study as being the basis, and I mean the basis, the framework for why, and this is in front of the, the, the uh, you know, the uh, uh, Nobel Prize audience, that this is the basis for shifting from a threshold model to a linear dose response model on a really flawed study. But I'm going to have to say Muller was a lot smarter than uh, just about everybody else. And Muller knew, this is my interpretation, Muller knew that he was playing a game with us, or the scientific community, and he knew that it was flawed. And so what happened is that when World War II was coming on, Muller had to uh, try to get back to the United States, and he was over in, in Edinburgh. And so what happened was that he looked for jobs all through the United States, but Muller was a cantankerous uh, individual, had all kinds of issues, even though he was viewed as brilliant and, and talented, but difficult to work with at different times, and, and people didn't really want to put up with that. And so he looked all around, and he couldn't get a job, but he found a job in one place in the United States, and as it turns out, it happens to be in my hometown, where my university is, and, and, and he got a job at Amherst College. Uh, one mile from uh, where my office is, actually. And so how did he get the job? Well, he got the job because um, the person who was uh, chairman of the, uh, the biology department in Amherst was also a PhD from uh, the same graduate advisor, Thomas Hunt Morgan, from Columbia. And so he was able to get his old buddy, graduate student, Muller, a job back in my town. And so, so Muller, in 1940, comes to, the university, uh, comes to Amherst College and, uh, and, and sets up shop, so to speak. And so what happened was that we all know that there was a Manhattan Project, and it was to develop the atomic bomb. Uh, we tend to focus on the development of the bomb and the explosion of the bomb, because that's, that's the big story. But there was a big side story, and that was the U.S. government was very interested in trying to understand uh, what the biological effects of uh, radionuclides were. And there was going to be atomic workers, there were going to be uh, environmental issues, and they wanted to have some knowledge as to what to do. And so while, you know, Oppenheimer and others are developing the bomb <laughs> out in the Southwest, uh, there's work going on on the, uh, on the genetic toxicology of, of this. And this is where health physics was born as well. Oh, that's very interesting right there, too. Well, as it turns out, uh, Muller, um, Muller links up with the, um, the person whose mom typed his, uh, his speech, his presentation back in 1927 at the Berlin Conference. Uh, Kurt Stern had migrated to the United States, was a professor of 
um, biology slash genetics at the University of Rochester. And Rochester was a strong school in terms of genetics and radiation. And they got a series of large uh, contracts grants from the Atomic Energy Commission to look at the effects of uh, radiation on, on um, mutations, chromosomes, and the like. And, and what happened is they, they really split it into two zones. They were going to look at the effects on mice so they could cover a mammalian model. Um, but uh, Stern was really a, he was a, a fruit fly person. And, and Muller, having been in fruit flies and so much emphasis on, on you know, genetics of fruit flies, they gave large grants to look at both areas, fruit flies and mice. And the person in charge of the fruit fly was this fellow by the name of Donald Charles. Um, very, very weird situation. Uh, happened, and that is that I, I would have thought that, well, yeah, the, the Drosophila would be really good for uh, understanding background, the basic biology. You could do lots of work with Drosophila, maybe figure out what the, the, the underlying mechanisms of mutation might be. But the, the mouse would be really important for application onto human risk assessment. So the two could work really well together, and um, Charles and, and Kurt Stern were considered very talented uh, people. So they gave they gave the grants to a really good place, and that was the uh, University of Rochester. And so, and so um, I would have to say Stern knew that he had this powerhouse talent by the name of Herman Muller, who was only a really a five or six hour drive away from him. And so he, he worked a deal with the Atomic Energy Commission, and he got Muller to be uh, given clearance and to be hired as a paid consultant uh, to the uh, Manhattan Project in, in Rochester. And so, and so began this relationship. But what, what happened, because I'll go back to your question, and that is that Muller knew that this dissertation in Edinburgh was weak. He had to have known that. I mean, let's put it this way. I'm not a geneticist, and I'm assuming Muller could really tear apart a study a lot better than me. And I went into that study, and there was very little left standing after I got through with it. I suspect that Muller being far more you know, insightful than me, uh, saw everything that I saw and stuff that I, that I haven't seen. Put it that way, right? And knew it was weak, but he was staking his future on it. So guess what he does? He's, he's powerfully influential. He goes and uh, does several things, but he convinces Stern to replicate what that graduate student did. And this is what they would do. They would look at total dose versus dose rate. This is actually a pretty amazing situation that happens. And in a letter to, this is uh, just uh, amazing as well, because I'm the only one that's, I think, ever uh, tried to figure out, that, you know, where did all these uh, genetic subclones come from and all this extra variation? And, and in letters to, uh, to Stern from Muller, Muller says, oh, we had a problem out in Edinburgh. We, we never got down to having homozygous uh, species, we had too much variability. So he did recognize the problem. Yes, yes. Did he, did, he shares that in writing with Stern. Does he share that with the scientific community and publications? No. That is amazing. And, and so what happens is that uh, they, they begin to try to do this total dose versus dose rate study. Because, uh, but when you're doing the Manhattan Project, it's a lot different than one graduate student with Muller out in Edinburgh. And I'd have to say, based upon my reading of all the letters and everything, the multiple letters from Muller and the student, Muller was very rarely around. The student, Muller did teach him the basis, basics of how to do genetic crosses, but that's kind of like teaching me how to do some programming or, or how to cook some meal at home and then my wife takes off for the weekend and I'm left on my own. <laughs> you know, you really need somebody looking over your shoulder a number, for a prolonged period of time to get it right. And, and this, this student, was his letters were calls for help and, and he just wasn't delivering. And it, and, and it ended up, you could just see that the, that the project was much more of a um, concept proposal, you know, initiation research rather than the real deal. Not something you'd go in front of the Nobel Prize audience and claim we're going to change uh, from a threshold to LNT because of because of this student's. I mean, uh, that that's, that Muller could even do that. I mean, t just takes. Uh, um, I'm not sure what it takes, but it it, it takes uh, uh, a certain amount of bravado that that I certainly don't have. 
put it that way, and probably most other people to 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 you know overstate your case. Um, you know, while talking to your friends, you know, look at the, the size of the fish I caught. But to overstate your case, you know, in front of a Nobel Prize audience when it didn't really justify it, and and maybe he thought that nobody would ever find out, and yeah, maybe nobody would have found out except I just happened to have dug into this stuff, you know, 60 or 70 years later, right? I mean, really kind of uh, very unusual and that these papers would have been preserved and the letters preserved and, and that I was able to get them, you know, that sort of thing. That, that is one of the most fascinating parts to me. I, the entire story is fascinating, but the fact that all of this documentation is preserved and, and we're, we'll have access to that documentation as well is is my understanding. Um, so it's all it's all there. It's it's there. It's there for the public to uh, to enjoy. I mean, these are preserved. I I have to say that I can't say that Mueller uh, intended to preserve these, um, and maybe he never knew. But Mueller's last graduate student, um, when the old man was was nearing uh, the end of the road in terms of life, uh, Mueller made plans um, to preserve what he had and. and and, and that, I'd have to say also, this is going on, you know, in 1930s, right? The late 1930s, uh, maybe 1940, but 38 and 39 where the dissertation's done. And Muller's dying in 1967. It's, it's a long, it's 30 years later, right? And so Muller probably can't even remember that student, that dissertation. And, and his last graduate student realized that, that his advisor, Dr. Muller, it was a, is a historical figure, a major figure in, in, uh, in the world of science, just a major figure, and, and, and his papers need to be preserved. And I, and I have some letters, this is so interesting, Muller, you know he's on his deathbed almost, and he's telling the student, you have to go and talk to, um, you know, Altenberg, his best friend, Altenberg, he's suffering from this condition and this condition, I don't know how much longer he's going to live either, but you've got to get to Altenberg before he dies, you've got to get to this one. Muller's telling the graduate student in these letters what to do, and he, he, sees, he sees it, and, and so uh, I would have to say that that this graduate student, um, you know, who now is in his upper 80s, still alive, and who has uh, great love for his mentor, but while at the same time, you know, he could see, um, uh, you know, see the humanity or the human limitations, right. and Mullet put it that way, uh, did a great thing uh, by, um, by going through whatever Muller had, you know, Muller hoarded things, you know, all letters and all these, he saved all his old grant proposals, I mean, I mean, this is, what, what do you save in life, right? Well, Muller saved a lot, and, and it's preserved. And I spent a lot of money getting copies of these things and now have many files of my own, all transferred from this location, that location, to my, you know, UMass Central Muller file, um, where I have, you know, spent a lot of time looking, looking at that. But we get into now the Manhattan Project. This is like the big kahuna of, of that, that time period, because there's now, uh, you know, it's not like a graduate student working by himself without Muller. Muller's traveling around here and there. There's a lot of money. There are um, high-level people. There are people who know about radiation. There are people who, who know, um, you know, uh, genetics quite well. And then they, they brought in PhD levels outside of Rochester to help them do their work. They had staff support. Whereas, you know, this this graduate student, he's doing everything all on his own and probably not doing it very well. So they, 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 had, they, had, they had the staff to, to, try to, to try to do it well. And this is where they're going to try to replicate exactly. the, the PhD student's original work, or the, the experimental setup, yes. and make it better, improve it. Yeah, this is a big deal. This, I mean, this is a big deal. And Mueller feels as though he has, he's probably seen the students' data. Yeah, he probably knew that it was, it had extreme limitations. But this was his hope, and the students' data, based on the student, supported his hypothesis, right? And so, now maybe it had so many flaws, and if you did it right, it wouldn't support it. Um, but, but based upon what the student presented to him, it looked as though, it looks as though maybe he was right. And so Mueller, you know, when you roll the dice and you go forward, he, convert, he convinced uh, Kurt Stern that this is what they should do, and you know, he's, he's definitely senior to Stern. Now, I will have to point out something about Mueller and Stern just before we go forward. 
And that, yes, even though they met in 1927 over in Berlin and established his mom types his uh, Muller's paper and so forth. But in 1926, uh, Kurt Stern published a very significant paper on um, some of the basic genetics. And there's something in genetics called crossing over. It's when two chromosomes uh, break and they exchange um, and recombine genetic material. And, and this is uh, a, a very significant development for, for geneticists and was considered a um, very important in terms of trying to understand uh, the location of chromosome, uh, genes on chromosomes, things of that nature. And, and so, as it turns out, Kurt Stern um, becomes um, the, the one of the, perhaps the first to document this. And it's a big deal for a young scientist. Now, as it turns out, in 1920, 1928, 1929, uh, Muller does the same sort of an experiment, and he publishes it, and he claims that he's the first one. That he, sounds like what he did with the original uh, gene mutation. Exactly. And so what happens is that Stern sees this, and he he's, had been previously mesmerized by Muller, based on what I've read, how he's written about Muller. But he sees this, and he knows that Muller knows that he was first. Because Muller knows everything about these narrow areas. If you're publishing in that area, you know what was first, right? But Muller doesn't cite this person. And so Stern writes a, a letter to Muller in which he has the backbone to challenge Muller. And it took uh, Muller six weeks, but he finally answers uh, uh, Stern. And he does it, uh, he does it in a way that that is, he takes control of the situation. You're right, I was so wrong. I don't know how that ever happened. Uh, I'm gonna do my best to, to, to give you the full credit. And, and what I've done now is I have written a long letter to um, the, the journal, perhaps Genetics or whatever the journal was, uh, giving you the full credit and, and, uh, and hoping this will, will be okay for you. And, and so uh, Kurt Stern, decides that, uh, well, okay, I'm satisfied now. So that, that calm, calmed it between the two of them. But under a normal circumstance, a person might have written a letter saying, I'm really offended by what Muller did. He didn't do this. He really knew what I was doing. Muller has to, you know, it could go, it could get very acrimonious. But, but how it was handled preserved their relationship. And, and that was very significant because if, I think if Muller had not preserved their relationship in that way, and if, and if Stern wasn't so accommodating to, to that explanation, they never would have come together again when it came to the, um, the big one, which was the Manhattan Project. And so I, but nonetheless, that, that episode um, illustrates, I think, a, the a character flaw a repeated character flower in Muller, and then as you pointed out, it's really the second time where somebody scooped him that he, he doesn't want to acknowledge them, and this time he gets caught and slapped, but it's not public, and, and I may be, have well been the only person who ever knew that that, that was the low letter exchange that, that uh, you know, the, a very timid, you know, Kurt Stern had, had the courage to challenge Muller, and so I was very impressed with Stern, and and I was actually somewhat impressed with Muller that Muller was really suave and sophisticated and knew how to control the situation and did. And, and Stern really didn't want to fight. He just wanted, he just he wanted, wanted it resolved. That, that's right. And so what happens is that, but so it's important, I think, just to put that on the table because, because where character is very important in science and trying to understand who you can trust and who you can't trust and, and, and what are their motives and, and things of that nature. And, and right now, and, and there's more going to be said on this, and as we have two, two looks at Muller um, and what I've presented so far, you know, one dealing with the, you know, not citing the people at all who came before him on, on the mutation. Even if they had limitations in their data, it, it should have been discussed and framed within a discussional purpose and acknowledgments given if they came first. But he didn't want to do that because uh, he wanted to be first. And he wanted to be first again because uh, Stern was, uh, this, this is a very uh, significant area as well. Who knows where the prize gonna, is going to come from, right? And so he was, 
hopped on two of those, and they weren't his first, but it didn't care. It didn't make any difference to Mueller. Thank you for watching the seventh episode on the historical foundations of the linear no threshold theory, where we learned about the efforts during the Manhattan Project to gain a deeper understanding of radiation's biological impact, and where Mueller acknowledges that Kurt Stern was the first to publish on the topic of chromosome aberrations resulting from radiation exposure. The next episode continues during the Manhattan Project era, where research findings concerning the effects of chronic exposures to ionizing radiation failed to support the LNT model, but were consistent with the threshold interpretation. The HPS is a trusted source of radiation information. We're a scientific organization, and as is offered with a scientific peer review process, viewers are encouraged to send comments or suggested corrections to factcheck at hps.org and be sure to include your sources so that we may correct the record if necessary. If any changes are made, they will appear at the end of this episode. Please visit our Ask the Experts website to ask questions or seek answers to common radiation related questions and view our fact sheets. We also have official position statements that can be found at hps.org. Finally, if you wish to join the Home for Radiation Protection Professionals, please visit the link below. We welcome you.